Right. <clears throat> oh, hey, there we go. We're live. Hey, we are live. Uh, calling Chris Anderson. I, I give up. Where? Where, Chris Anderson? Uh, where I you? am in um, Donington Valley in Wiltshire, uh, so near Aldbourne, and I'm on tour with a great band of brothers group. So, um, yeah, so I'm in the hotel, so bear with us, folks. Wow. I'm calling yes. Rick Byer in. You look kind of like you're in Chicago. I am in Chicago in the, the normal spot here. and uh, uh, But, of course, you know, uh, we welcome everyone who's coming. And wherever Chris and I and are, uh, Chris <laughs> and I are spending the globe with our inability to talk. And I haven't even started drinking yet. So uh, and you probably already have because it's much later there. Uh, but we still manage to be here on Sundays to have a cocktail and talk about history. Today, in a few minutes, we'll be talking about ancient Sparta. Uh, yeah. And Chris, I do want to mention here, sometimes we mention it at the beginning and sometimes at the end, but I want to thank all of our Patreon supporters and especially our Top Shelf supporters. Absolutely. Very, very grateful to all those people. Uh, to and just remember, them. everybody, we can make the font smaller. <laughs> right, right. We can fit more names. There is no <laughs> limit. We can do more pages. No limit. We can, uh, we can, there's a lot of things we can do, but you can support by going to patreon.com slash historyhappyhour. Uh, so, Chris, um, we, we also have a, a treat for everybody at the end of the show. Well, our guest is a treat and talking about Sparta. But then at the yeah. end of the show, you're going to do your big reveal. The big hat reveal, yes. The big hat reveal of what your mm -hmm. campaign hat is this year when you take yeah. groups on tour. In, Absolutely. Uh, in, didn't wear the hat today because it hasn't officially been announced. Oh, uh, wow. So it could, so. could, could, so it could still change. No, or it no. could. It, it, it's been. It's been. It's pretty sad. The it's final opinion sad. is yet to be written. Okay. Okay. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so, so who have we got with us? Any anybody there in the audience, Chris? Well, Xavier is is calling himself Leonidas, and he's joining us not from Thermopylae. And no, uh, Frank K from Idaho. Uh, Laurel I call him uh, Jim Latin. Uh, Stephen Sowerby, who I saw today, so it was good to see Stephen again. Uh, he's working on a lovely car in a workshop. Uh, oh yes, uh, greeting Stephen, and yeah. that's a that's an amazing car he's got there in his garage. And of course, we do have uh, Chris Jackson and Doug McCord and Doreen and all sorts of people. Well, Chris, I think we've 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 built up enough of an audience that we should just start giving them some content. What do you, yeah. <laughs> what do you think? All so, right, so you want the drum roll? Give me a cue, and we'll get started. All right. <laughs> The bar is open. The bar is open, and uh, we are ready to talk about uh, ancient Greece. We've all heard of Sparta and the Spartans. I mean, the warrior state, the Battle of Thermopylae, the 300. Uh, yeah. What made the Spartans such fearsome warriors? And Chris, how much of what we know is real and, and how much is myth? So those are interesting questions, and since neither you nor I know the answer to them, we, we are joined today by Dr. Philip Matty Matuzic, uh, author of Sparta, Rise of a Warrior Nation. He holds a doctorate in ancient history from St. John's College, uh, Oxford University, reasonably well-known spot. I've heard um, of that. Yep, yeah, I've heard of that. I've heard of that. Yeah. He has been teaching and writing for more than 20 years, and when it comes to Sparta and ancient warfare, he also brings to bear his personal military experience, both as a conscript in Rhodesia and with the Territorial Army in Britain. So it is a great pleasure to welcome Matty to the show today. How are you doing? Hello there. Oh, I'm good. Thank welcome. you. <laughs> Excellent. I, I, you know, I, I, one of the people have, have already started asking questions. One that, that, that came up right away, but we'll, we will save it for a while, is what would the Spartans be drinking if they were here watching History Happy Hour today? Um, but we can, you can think about that and we'll come back. I'll I start. can answer immediately if you like. Oh, yes. Okay, play. Go ahead. Jump in. Okay. Well, the Spartans, um, it would depend where your Spartan was. If they were on campaign, they had actually a special cup called the Spartan Cup which had little bumps on the inside of the cup so that you could just dip it into a river and when you tipped it to drink, the mud would get caught on the little ridges so you could drink your water moderately pure. If you were back home, you could drink some of the famous Spartan black broth, which was basically made out of a kind of fermented bread. And um, 
when they invited a, a fam fairly famous um, Athenian playwright to try the stuff, he ate a few mouthfuls, put down his spoon and said, now I understand why you Spartans do not fear death. <laughs> Oh, I think I'll stick to gin and tonics. Uh, yeah, I've got a nice, I've got a nice beer. No, no uh, Spartan, famous Spartan broth for me. Um, but just a, a very general question to start, uh, Maddie. Sparta was a Greek city-state that rose to prominence roughly 800 to 500 BC. Don't call me out if my dates are a little off. Um, but there were a lot of Greek city-states. Athens, as you mentioned, most famously, Thebes, Argos, etc. What made Sparta so unique that it was actually considered pretty fascinating by the Spartan contemporaries back in the day and remains fascinating today? Okay, um, to answer that question, I'll, I can do it with one word, and that is Messonia. Um, when we go back to 800 BC, Sparta is actually a fairly normal and pretty undistinguished city-state. Um, what made Sparta Sparta was the fact that they took on and conquered their much larger neighbor, which was not so much a state as what the Greeks called an ethnos, a tribal region called Messonia. And that's basically everything on the other side of the Tagatus mountain range you can see here. Off to the left, is that right? Yeah, that's right. And everything, that river Pisanias, Mount Itoma, Steniclarus, Cape Acretus, that was all Messonian territory. And Sparta, as a result, had what you might say a tiger by the tail, or to put it in the ancient phrase, a wolf by the ears. They had taken on and conquered a state much bigger than themselves, and now they had to try and keep it. And to do that, they became militarized to an extent that you've hardly ever seen in any society ever. Okay. All right. Well, so, so you say, one of the things that, that I wanted to ask you about, you say that in order to kind of understand Sparta and understand what propels them forward, you have to understand their physical surroundings. So why is yeah. that important? And, and what were Sparta's physical surroundings? Why does their place in, the, in that part of the world matter? Okay, well, if you have a look at the um, Peloponnese again, what you will see is that um, you're, you've got an island, which is basically um, narrowing up to a peninsula covered by Corinth at the top. And Sparta itself is well upriver in a little river valley. And those mountains that you see on each side actually also go around the top. So Sparta is actually cut off from the rest of Greece in the winter. And if you look at those capes, Tainarum and Malaya, they were famous for their ability to wreck ships. There are very few ports on the whole of that coastline. So Sparta should have been just an isolated rural town somewhere deep inside a very unfashionable part of Greece. And the result is that the Spartans were never trendsetters. They were never up to the date with the latest movements. They were always isolationist and very much self-involved. And part of that is dictated by their geography. And, and so they develop this... Um uh, kind of a military estate here. Everything in there, it's a military-centric culture. Everything revolved around military training from the youngest of ages, I think it's fair to say. Can you give us a little bit of, of an overview of, of that, that life in Sparta? And I know it changes over the centuries, so it's kind of, kind of finding a ground there to, as, it, as it became fully developed. Okay, um, as I said, when we start off with Sparta, we have a normal culture, which is producing some fairly good pottery, some fairly reasonable playwrights. But once they've got militarized, the whole objective of being a Spartan, and bear in mind, by the way, that not all people living in Spartan were Spartans. Um, they were a very hierarchical society. And at the top was the warrior class called the Spartiates. And to run you quickly through there, before you became a Spartiate, you had to pick your parents very carefully. And your parents picked you very carefully. So um, if you were a bit of a wimp, it was regarded as perfectly acceptable that your wife should go off and get pregnant with somebody who is better genetic material than you. Um, and 
In fact, it was one of the few societies that did that so extensively, they almost practiced polyandry. So, um, having made sure that you were of the right genetic material before you're born, once you're born, they then take you and if they think there's something iffy about you, they then take you up onto Mount Tagatus and carefully place you on a ledge as a newborn baby in the spirit of scientific inquiry to see if you're going to survive the night. If you succeeded in that, then you were brought down again and managed a fairly normal upbringing. We're talking about boys here, by the way, until just before um, you reached the age of six or seven, after which you began what was called the agoge, which um, basically was child cruelty refined to a very large degree. Um, the kids there were separated from their parents, kept in what were called packs, and extreme bullying and um, hazing were regarded as excellent material for building character. Um, you were also pitched against other packs of boys in pitched battles for certain um, contests. And as one of the really charming little bits that helped to build a Spartan boy's character, you were given a puppy, which you cared for, fed and brought up. And then when you reached a certain point, you killed the puppy. Um, what, what, you know, what, is the point of, what is the point of killing the puppy? This is the first puppy killed on History Happy Hour. So <laughs> we can't just stop and let that go by. It builds character. It makes you into a hard, unfeeling, emotionless warrior. Okay. Good to know. And if you're good at puppy killing, you can then go on and join an organization graduate. called... <laughs> yeah. You graduate to something called the Cryptea, which was, if you like, the Spartan elite for psychopathic youths. <laughs> and <laughs> these guys were sent into Messania, which, as I said, was an area which the Spartans conquered and spent the next half a millennium desperately trying to hold down. And one of the ways they did this was if anyone became a community leader, not necessarily an anti-Spartan community leader, but anyone who showed any potential for leadership, the job of the Critea was to hide out in the Messianian countryside, locate these people, and kill them. And wow. once they'd succeeded in that for a while, you could then go back to Sparta, be inducted into the army and become part of the Spartan elite. So there's, there's a nice childhood for you. Uh, it, it makes, makes British boarding schools sound uh, positively uh, <laughs> lovely. <laughs> well, the sad thing is that um, an awful lot of um, British boarding schools are actually modeled on the Spartan theme quite deliberately. <laughs> Is and that... I notice Doreen has mentioned the Unsullied from Game of Thrones. And yes, that's where um, George R.R. R. Martin got the puppy killing idea from. Oh, OK. Wow. Wow. Um... So, so Matty, you mentioned that the, the Spartans gave themselves a clear narrative. So what was mm -hmm. the Spartan narrative and how much of that narrative that they relied on was fact and how much of it was fiction? Um, well, a lot of it was fact. Um, the Spartans really were um, a brave, stoical warrior race. Um, they were nowhere near as incorruptible as they liked to make out. In fact, um, the Spartan delight in the simple life tended to vanish whenever a Spartan managed to get out and um, try the delights of Athens or Corinth on his own. Right. And Spartan commanders were famously bribable. But um, the actual myth was based on a guy called um, Lycurgus who, if you read Plutarch's Life of Lycurgus, lays out the myth of the man in great detail, including things like how he determined that Spartans shouldn't use money, we go back to this very bribable aspect, but instead long, clumsy copper spits as their currency. And this just shows how um, far-seeing Lycurgus was, because he made this edict at least 200 years before money ever was introduced to um, the Greek economy. <laughs> And the other thing about Lycurgus was everyone had to rigidly follow the laws of Lycurgus, but they were never written down. So the current people in charge in Sparta could always say, this is our ancient immutable law. And if they really needed to, make it up on the spot. Well, and it wasn't, um, it, it, not being written down wasn't, wasn't a bug. It was a feature, right? That was, it exactly. Was, it was Very one of the so. laws was that it couldn't be written 
Yeah. Like, like law number one of Lycurgus, you can't write down the laws of Lycurgus. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Essentially. Um, so, but, but part of that, you, so you say a lot of the myth is true. <clears throat> I, what I was interested in is, is, but there's a PR aspect to the Spartans also. It struck me reading your book. Because first of all, you know, you, they're they're fearsome warriors, and we can talk a little bit about about how they became, uh, uh, you know, what their strategy was, what their tactics were. But um, uh, they didn't win every battle. Um, mm -hmm. Their most famous battle was a defeat. Um, mm -hmm. They sometimes showed up late on purpose. That was one of my favorite things, so that they could uh, avoid fighting or let somebody else fight first. When they did win, it sometimes involved trickery or, mm -hmm. or uh, smart political alliances. So obviously if people think you're invincible warriors, that's great psychological warfare. They're not gonna wanna fight you. But how, so how much of it was like, this is the PR that the Spartans are putting out and how much of it was actual fact? Okay, um, by the way, Nancy, we'll get back to your question about life for women and young girls, because that's a good one. Um, oh. But yeah, when we get back to um, fighting, and the invincible Spartan warrior. This was due to two factors in Greek warfare. The first one was that when you're a hoplite, you have a helmet, you have a shield that basically covers you from chin to knees, and you have a stabbing spear. And, and you've used the word hoplite, so we just wanna, it's probably a word that some people in the audience don't know, I'm gonna guess. What's a hoplite? It's, the it's an upper class Greek heavy warrior. Okay. Um, heavy infantry man, to clarify further. So um, I've just described the standard hoplite panoply, as it was called. And the point with that is it's actually quite hard to kill somebody when they are equipped like that and fighting like that. So the way that a Greek battle actually inflicts casualties is when one side breaks and the other people pursue and stab them in the back. And at that point, of course, people chuck away their shield, which is a famous Greek metaphor for giving up the fight. Now, one of the things you have to think about when you're in a battle line in ancient Greece is, are the people with me going to break and run? Because if they're going to break and run, I want to be the one who runs first, because the one who <laughs> runs first is the one who gets off the battlefield alive. But if you're not going to break and run, then I want to stick in the battle line and be among the victors. The trouble is, if you're fighting the Spartans, the Spartans aren't going to break. It's just a matter of time before you do. <laughs> Particularly yeah. as in the Greek battle line, the place of honor was on the right and the weakest side was on the left, which means you had the best of a Spartan battle line, which is the Spartiates, against the weakest of the opponents. So if you're one of those weakest of the opponents, you're sitting there thinking, hey, here I am, officially the worst troops in the army facing the Spartiates who never give up, never stop fighting and won't rest till I'm killed. Okay, now exactly how clear is the line of sight for those trees way behind me? And the result is the Spartans won because people thought they were going to win. So it's, in other words, it's both. It's, 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 they are fearsome, but it's also good psychological warfare. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy to some extent, yeah. yeah. So, so, Betty, I mean, I have a lot of questions, but, but let's pick up Nancy's question. So. You know, we've talked about a very masculine, warrior-dominated culture. Uh, that's one of the things that everybody's fascinated by with uh, ancient Sparta, uh, and we'll talk more about it. But what was the, what was life like for women, uh, and what was the role that women played in this society? If you had to be an ancient Greek and be female, be Spartan. Really? Um, we hear that the young boys had, um, shall we say, a kind of um, rough upbringing. Girls were brought up at home. They were educated, which is something that um, even the Athenians were a little bit wary about. They received an education in dance, physical training, and they actually wore these, um, instead of the Athenian women, who when they went out were veiled and were basically walking tents, um, Spartan women were actually nicknamed thigh highs because they wore these very short skirts. And if they were exercising, they actually did it naked. And the other thing about Spartan women is, unlike Athenian women or women in many places in Greece, they could actually inherit. So um, towards the end of the life of Sparta, 
we find um, the majority of Spartan land was actually owned by Spartan women. So um, Spartan girls had a much better life than um, the life of, let's say, Athenian women. They were nowhere near as cloistered at home. They could get out and about. And um, of course, as we, um, we mentioned at the start of the thing, if you were a Spartan woman and you saw a particularly hunky guy you fancied, society urged you to go for it. <laughs> but, but there was, uh, you know, part of that also, and you talk about this in the book, is they did have some, um, what I would consider unusual customs regarding marriage uh, and regarding yeah. the, uh, the, uh, how, how the man and wife get together after marriage. But tell us a little bit about that. Okay. Um, the, one of the interesting things about um, a Spartan upbringing is you were encouraged to be sneaky and thieving. <laughs> the boys were deliberately underfed so that they learned how to forage for themselves. And um, once a couple got married, the husband still remained in barracks, separate from his wife. And it was up to him and his beloved to try and contrive ways that they could get together in their own time without getting caught. And it's only after the birth of um, their first child or their first children that he was actually allowed to move out of barracks and set up home for himself. Wow. Okay, so, and, and uh, um, yeah. It's some, and it goes on. I don't, we don't have to go into chapter and verse, but there's some pretty crazy stuff in that part of Spartan life that, uh, that was quite a surprise to me. Um, one so, of the things to remember, though, is that Spartan women were fully bought into the whole Spartan warrior ethos. So you get these interesting stories about um, a Spartan mother who kits, his, kits her son out for work. And by work, I mean going off and stabbing Messonians or Athenians or whatever. And the kid looked at his sword, looked it up and down and said, it's a bit short, isn't it? And his mother said, take one step closer. <laughs> yeah, don't, 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 don't piss off mom. <laughs> right. Or the other one that, uh, that you mentioned is the, the mother who, whose uh, uh, farewell to her son is, is come back with your shield or on it. Meaning, you know, don't throw away your shield. Don't be a coward. Either bring your shield back or come back dead. Yeah, because um, one thing about these big um, hoplite shields is they're very useful for um, stretchers. Yeah. You can just sort of put the body across it and carry him off the battlefield. Chris, whose turn is it? I've lost track. Because well, I was just our, gonna... guest, our guest is so terrific that I'm, uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm paying more attention to him than I am to what we should be doing. So do you have something to ask? I'm happy to go to you. And no, he just froze. He t chose that moment, Natty, <laughs> to freeze. Strategic, strategic. I, I know. I, I think he's a button. You know, Chris is in a hotel, everybody who, if you weren't here at the very beginning, he's in a hotel in the UK. And um, uh, the Wi-Fi is a bit spotty, although he's been good so far. Chris, if you can still hear us, I think you are going to have to call back in and I'm going to just remove you here until you uh, until you link back in with us. So I'm going to do that uh, and uh, take him out there. And Maddie, uh, it's just you and me for a, a bit and we'll see how this goes. Um, um, it's funny, we're talking about these the, these expressions. Um, uh, the the word uh, laconic uh, comes mm -hmm. from the area uh, that the Spartans, uh, the peninsula the Spartans lived in, Laconia. And one of the stories that I've always loved as well, and obviously it's, it's quite famous, uh, is uh, I guess it's Philip of uh, Macedonia who says, yep. you know, you're, you're advised to submit without further delay, for if I bring my army into your land, I will destroy your farms, slay your people, and raise your city. And the Spartan reply is? If. If. <laughs> if. if. Um, so, uh, is it, is it, you, you, a lot of what we know about Sparta comes from other people because the Spartans were mm -hmm. famously not just laconic, but closed mouth. They were pretty secretive yeah. about how things operated in, uh, Sparta. So, uh, how has that, uh, shaped or warped our view of the Spartans? I mean, that's, that's kind of a little bit of interpretation for you because, you don't have the other side of the story sitting there, but, but how do you think it might have? Well, um, one of the things is that a lot of what we know about Sparta is by a guy who lived there for quite a long time called Xenophon, which is, he was Athenian, 
But his name is actually great because it means speaks to strangers. And he was very <laughs> pro-Spartan. And he wrote this really idealizing idea of um, Sparta and what a great place it was and how the Spartans were modest and honest and um, God-fearing, whereas the rest of Greece was basically a hedonistic cesspit. So um, a lot of the idealization of Sparta we can see in the writing of people like Xenophon and also in that other complete prat of an ancient philosopher, which is Plato, who greatly admired the Spartans and um, loved their ideas on eugenics and all the rest of it. Um, but on the other hand, when we get towards the later period, we see people like Aristotle, who was totally unimpressed by the Spartans. And he actually wrote at one point, the Spartans, everyone used to fear them because they were the only people who had a professional warrior class. Now we all have a professional warrior class and everybody beats them. And he sounded very pleased about that. <laughs> um, so, so um, uh, is there, is there, the, the Spartans didn't leave a lot of material on themselves, did they? They didn't leave almost any. Um, some of the only stuff we have on the Spartans is some very early poetry from the Mycenaean Wars. And um, that was written by somebody who was actually a Spartan leader, who was also a good poet, and who also was an imported Athenian. <laughs> okay. He was actually brought in on the advice of the Oracle of Delphi to help them manage the war. And he wrote some good poetry for inspiring hoplites. <laughs> so, but so in a way, it's kind of like, I mean, pick your country, but it's like, it's like if a thousand years or two thousand years from now, everything you knew about the United States came from what the friends and enemies of the United States elsewhere thought and not from people in the United States. So it's, it, it, you know, the chances are good that if we could go back and be in Sparta, we would discover that some of the things we think we know are, are dead on and some of them are like a little bit off and the positive or negative. Oh yes, um, for example, you know a lot of the Spartans, or to be a Spartan, you had to have a certain size of estate, which you had to maintain to pay your mess dues, which made you a Spartiate. And a lot of these estates were in Messania. And we're pretty sure that when the Spartans were in Messania, they tended to kick back and um, ease off on the Spartan lifestyle that they had to do in the city itself. So when the campaigning season was off, um, we don't really know to what extent the Spartans relaxed and became more like normal people. Hmm. Chris, welcome back. Uh, to yeah, I'm sorry about that, guys. No, but, it's uh, not your fault. You know, that's, so we'll blame. I don't know how far UK my question. I don't know how far my question got before it got. Uh, we did not didn't. hear any of your question. <laughs> oh well, I just I had, I was I was reading that quote from from Thucydides, and I won't read it all again. But basically saying but you can. Uh, well, okay. He says. I didn't hear uh, it. All right. He says. I suppose if Lacedaemon was ever to be abandoned and nothing but temples and foundations of the buildings remained, later eras would refuse to believe the city was as powerful as its reputation. The city is neither compact in form nor boasting magnificent temples or public buildings. Rather, it is a collection of villages in the old Greek style, and it would all seem rather inadequate. So those aren't very promising beginnings for an all-powerful city-state. Um, and so... What do you think set Sparta on a different and more successful course, given its inauspicious um, beginnings? To, to correct you there for a moment, Chris, that was Sparta at the height of its power as a Greek city-state. It was still a collection of buildings with mediocre temples and no city wall. <laughs> <laughs> so even success wasn't successful? No, its success was very successful, but it didn't go much for material things. So whereas right. the Athenians had the Parthenon and the theater of Dionysius, etc., the Spartans, they actually had a rule saying that um, you couldn't join your logs together to make tall pillars. So you had to make do with whatever height of tree you cut down. Um, so all their buildings were pretty crude and makeshift. Their temples were very far from splendid. And as Thucydides says, um, if you went there as a visitor, you'd look around and say, well, is that it? Right. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it, and that's kind of how you open the book, right? Is is what it would have looked like to the ambassador from uh, from Persia coming in, you know, I guess 480 or 481, 
uh, BC and you know who probably couldn't believe that you know this little place is supposed to be the most powerful you know superpower of the region uh, it seems that probably would have seemed unimaginable to somebody not steeped in their history this well, was yeah. Sparta <laughs> so, well you know when I, when, I, when I was reading it I, I thought about um, in my head I was making comparisons to Prussia insofar as you know, they say that Prussia had very inauspicious beginnings. It was remote. It was poor. Didn't have a lot going for it. Yet they go out and they become Prussia. And and so when I was reading about Sparta, I was like, wow, it's pretty remote. You know, they're kind of this tiny little place. But somehow they have the energy and the drive to go forth and, and become what they become. And I, I don't know. I just found it interesting. Okay, one of the things to look at there, by the way, is the Spartans famously didn't go forth. Um, right. Because, as I said at the beginning, the Spartans had conquered Messania, and the problem with that is the Messanians outnumbered them about 10 to 1. In fact, the Spartans had a rule that you should be able to put one Spartan hoplite against seven Messanians at any given time. And the result was that if the Spartan army was to actually go off and campaign, say, in northern Greece, they were vulnerable to the Messonians getting their act together, coming over the mountains and wiping out Sparta. Mm -hmm. So one of the problems the Spartan army had is they never liked to be more than about a week's march away from Sparta because that was how long it would take the Messonians to come over the mountains and wipe out town if they um, ever took their eye off the ball. Mm -hmm. So the Spartans never campaigned very much abroad, and that's one of the reasons, for example, why they weren't particularly keen on going to Marathon. Because if they did fight the Persians and the Persians wiped them out, then you can bet the Messonians would be in a hurry to finish the job. Right. Uh, a couple of questions from the audience are coming in, so I'd like to- Yeah, I've to kept an eye on those, so let, let's do them. them. Let's do one uh, from uh, Jim Latin here, who asks, how did the life expectancy of a Spartan warrior compare to others of the day? Pretty well, particularly as you're not going to die in battle as quickly. <laughs> And also, of course, um, you have cold swims in the river Eurotas, um, vigorous exercise every day, and um, a moderately healthy diet if you exempt the black broth. So, yes, yeah, Spartan warriors did pretty well in that respect. Uh, and Interestingly, another... by the way, just to change Go something ahead. on there for the Spartan woman, is in terms of privileges in society, um, a Spartan woman giving birth was regarded as the equivalent of one campaign fought by a Spartan man. Okay, so badge of honor for her in that situation. Well, you need Spartans to carry on the tradition. Uh, absolutely. Um, and the other question, at which I, you know, comes from um, uh, Neil here, is, you know, what was the size of the military? Did it include cavalry? Yes, um, there was cavalry. The only trouble is, as I've said, Greek battles were mainly fought by heavy infantry with spears. And if you want to design a military unit that is um, anathema to cavalry, you'd probably go with heavy infantry with spears. So cavalry were mainly kept in reserve, used for scouting, and also for unleashing upon the enemy once they're broken. They didn't actually have a great influence on the battle itself. And, and as for the size of the army, yeah. that's critical. Because as I said, to be a Spartiate, you had to own land, and you had to pay your mess dues, otherwise you dropped out of the top rank. And because Sparta also, as I said, allowed women to inherit, and because the demands for membership of the top rank were so demanding, the number of Spartiates dropped all the way through Spartan history. So at the time of the Persian Wars, there were about 10,000 Spartiates in the army. By the time we get down to the Peloponnesian War, we're looking at five or 6,000. By the time we look at Sparta actually getting beaten up by the Thebans at the Battle of Leuctra, we're looking at about 500. So one of the problems with the Spartans is the size of their army just kept dropping. So, Rick, do you want to keep going with some of these questions here, or do you want me to? Uh, uh, sure. Um, so um, here's another one, uh, which is a question of what resources did they get from the Mycenaean territory? You know, why conquer it at all? Why, why bother to conquer it if it's going to be a big uh, PIA to deal with it? Because you've got the land for your estates, you've got the agricultural resources, 
we've got the manpower. Oh, it's because li living space, in other words. <laughs> to, yes, uh, to and the Masonians were kept in a condition slightly worse than slavery. Um, even though they occupied the place for 500 years, every year the Spartan Euphors, who were sort of um, like the consuls in Rome, would declare war upon the Masonians because that allowed any Spartan to kill any Masonian for any reason. And the result is they were kept in a state called Helotage, which was like slavery, but also tied to the land. And the Spartans could maintain the society they did because they exploited the resources of Masonia to do so. And once they did lose Messania, because the Thebans kicked them out, they just went back to being another fifth-rate city-state on, on the Peloponnese and um, ceased to have any significance apart from their own history. Chris? Well, I was, I was going to say one of the things that I, I was curious about um, is you know, what was the attitude of these other Greek city-states to the Spartans? Because they seem, I mean, are they an outlier to Greek society? And are all the other Greek city-states going, these people over here are, are a little wacky? Or oh, yeah, the, did they the, accept the them attitude. as they, what they were? Or, I mean, oh, no, their attitude is that the um, Spartans were totally wacky. But they were also <laughs> very admirable in what they did. So, right. for example, um, they were watching a um, play in Athens, and a Spartan delegation came to watch the play as well because the Spartans were actually quite cultured as well. And um, a group of Athenian older men came and the Spartans immediately got up and evac abandoned their seats for these older men to take over. And one of the Athenian philosophers was watching said, everyone knows the right thing to do. The Spartans are the only ones who do it. <laughs> so there was a, a great admiration for Sparta, but at the same time, everyone realized they'd set themselves a superhuman standard, which nobody else could or even wanted to match. The other thing about Sparta uh, that I think doesn't necessarily uh, uh, come out in some of, the, uh, some of the popular mythology at least, Sparta is a slave state and slavery yeah. is integral to their society. It probably couldn't run without slavery. In fact, fear of slave uprising may have contributed uh, to Sparta's development, you know, in addition to the Messenians. So talk a little bit about uh, uh, Spartan slavery and the Helots, who are the people who are the slaves in Sparta and who also outnumber the Spartan warriors. Okay, um, first of all, we've got to actually differentiate between Helots and slaves. Um, they were actually two different classes of people okay. in that slaves are out and out property. You know, you've got a slave life, you've got a broom. Um, these are just parts of your household equipment. The helots were regarded as, um, if you like, more peasants tied to the land that you could do whatever you liked with, but they weren't actually slaves. And while the Athenians had slaves, in fact, it's been estimated somewhere between a third to um, three-fifths of Athenian population were slaves, um, in Sparta, the main manpower came from the helots. And um, helotage was a defined if you like, quasi-legal state or condition. And um, every Spartan estate in Messania had its share of helots. In fact, any Spartan estate had its share of helots who worked the land, couldn't leave the land, and needed permission for the landowner to do virtually anything, build a house, get married, whatever. So um, it was definitely um, a, how should we put it, subservient state, but maybe just above slavery in some ways. And how many Helots were there compared to how many Spartiates were there? Um, I would say they were outnumbered. Of course, any figure from the ancient world, you'd partly suck it out of your thumb. Yeah. But I would say that um, <laughs> if, if the Helots were to get together an army, they could probably manage about 30,000. So the Spartans were outnumbered at any given time between 7 to 1 and 20 to 1. By the Helots and the Messenians. So yeah, they, no, yeah, the Messenians were Helots almost by definition. Oh, oh, but there okay. were other Helots as well okay. in other parts of um, the Eurotus Valley. As I explained earlier before we were on the air, I, I kept coming late to my classics classes uh, <laughs> uh, that were at 9 o'clock in the morning at Dartmouth, so I might have missed a few things along the way. So, Christopher. Yeah, no, so, um, well, a couple more questions from the audience sure. because, because they're great. Is, uh, Xavier wants to know, why why was sparta not a naval power in comparison to athens okay well if you've seen athens they have this beautiful 
port called the Piraeus, and they're a trading nation. You've got Athenian colonies scattered all over the Mediterranean, and um, they have very close ties with a lot of other islands in the Cyclades, for example. If you look at Sparta, they are 50 miles up a river valley, and um, this isn't conductive to a great naval tradition. That said, by the end of the Peloponnesian War, the Spartans did have a navy, and a pretty good navy as well, because it was paid for by the Persians. <laughs> Always helpful. <laughs> Uh, so uh, I'm just uh, uh, Frank asked a question. We may have we may have talked about it a little bit, but I'm going to bring it on anyway. Uh, he says, "Did the Spartans uh, check the fitness of their infants to determine whether they could become future warriors?" Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned a child being being left out. Uh, you know, how common do you think that was? Is that the kind of the only example of of sort of checking the fitness of children uh, for their warrior potential? Well, if a kid didn't have warrior potential, I mean, he basically wasn't fit to be a Spartan. So he was pretty much done for right there and then. They did believe in practicing postnatal birth control. Mm. Mm. In other words, it was quite likely the child was just taken away and killed. And as an example of that, at the start of the Peloponnesian War, the Spartans realized, oh, our army is going to be away for a while and we're going to have problems with um, the helots. So they said, we're recruiting helots to join the army. Any helots who join the army will be given special privileges and um, extra rights um, and even free to some extent from helotage. So any volunteers? And I think something like seven or eight helots volunteered. And they were taken to Sparta. They were given a big festival at the temples. And then they were marched away and nobody ever saw them again. Wow. Nice wow. The wow. Spartans were pretty unflinching <laughs> when it came to being ruthless. They, right. they, uh, you can see why the Nazis admired them so much. Well, that's we yeah. were talking about that the other day, that uh, uh, that you were saying that, that Hitler uh, had kind of a, a, a warm place in his heart for the, for the Spartans and their way of doing things. Uh, and, and he talked about that, didn't he? He did, yeah. Um, I'm not too up on my 20th century history, since for me the world finished in 470 AD. But... Um, <laughs> Yeah, from some of the bits I've read is you look at um, the philosophy at that time, which compares the Dionysian approach to life with um, the more rigid, I, I forget which one Nietzsche used, the other god, to compare the Spartan one. And the Spartan one was basically, you take an idea and you follow it unflinchingly to its logical conclusion. Whereas the other Greeks, such as the Athenians, realize that you're dealing with humans, it's going to be messy and fudges and compromises are necessary. And of course, um, it's the following any idea to the logical conclusion that made the Nazis such unpleasant people. All right. Among other things, yeah. So, so, so swinging to other political systems, uh, Maddie, could you uh, describe what was um, Sparta's view of democracy, since you know we always like to look back at the ancient Greek world um, and its foundational you know, aspects to democracy. What was this? What would a Spartan say about democracy? How did they view that? Well, again, if we go back to early Sparta, we're looking at um, one of the more successful democracies in Greece. This is Archaic Age Sparta, uh -huh. where um, one of the things that happened in the Archaic era is um, in Athens, you have people like um, Cleisthenes who booted out the oligarchs and set up a democracy. Now, what the Spartans did is their rulers managed to pretty effectively sidestep this. So they set up an assembly. They set up two, a group of leaders called the Euphers and a council of elders called the Gerosia. And when they wanted to... Um, get any resolution, they would address the assembly and get the vote. But after a few years, they unexpectedly discovered that the laws of Lycurgus said that if the assembly should speak crookedly, it was up to the Gerosia and the Euphos to correct their views. <laughs> so the assembly got a little bit kneecapped that way. <laughs> and in almost uniquely in Greece, the Institute of the Kingship survived. So you had two twin Spartan dynasties running together. So Sparta always had two collegiate kings. And the idea of that is one stayed at home to run the administration while the other took the army out and did the fighting. 
And whichever king was most suitable at the time took that particular job. So when Leonidas went off with the 300, there's actually still a team in place, so to speak, running Sparta. Well, and I guess we should talk about the 300 because yeah, this yeah. is this is the Battle of Thermopylae is the the uh, the it, it's the uh, Spartans uh, headline moment. Um, uh, mm -hmm. And it's been immemorialized in in uh, movies, especially the 300. Uh, and uh, you know, nothing with, to do with history, but a great movie. Uh, <laughs> but a great, uh, but a lot of that fun. happens a lot. Um, uh, yeah, hundred percent of the time, basically, uh, with historical <laughs> movies. But what? So what? What is the? What's the story there? Um, you know, are are there really three hundred men who, uh, and just three hundred men, who under Leonidas, the uh, one of the Spartan kings, who sacrificed themselves at Thermopylae, and what? Why does that serve any purpose? What's going on there? Okay. Um, I'm sure this would be three or four classes in your lecture series. <laughs> yes. So, uh, just, just, just compress it into about five minutes and you should be in good shape. <laughs> okay. Um, first of all, Thermopylae was not meant to be the Battle of Thermopylae. It was meant to be the Battle of Euboea because the Persians had a fleet and they were not particularly interested in getting around the little narrow land passage at Thermopylae. They wanted to sail around the island of Euboea, but unfortunately there was a united Greek fleet what you might call the North Aegean Treaty Organization, all gathered up there trying to stop them. So the Persians decided, first of all, they were going to try forcing their way through on land because they were not having a lot of success at sea. And the 300 were there basically as the cork in a bottle on a very, very narrow frontage between the cliffs and the sea. And there was already a wall in place there to stop it. So the Spartans... And to some extent, they were aware that this was going to be a really tough fight. Leonidas only ex accepted for the 300 men with children. So the family line would continue, even if all 300 were wiped out. But of course, the idea of fighting to the death only came once the Persians had made their way around the Spartan line. And the Spartans were surrounded and the Persians went in a mood to take prisoners anyway. So it's not that hard to fight to the death if you know you're going to die anyway but to give the spartans credit i think they would have done it anyway um but, but are there are there aspects of because you know there, we have a popular idea of what happened at thermopylae but uh, as a historian of the subject and who does a deep dive on it and you touch on it in a book but are there aspects of that battle that that you think that people aren't aware of or we should know more about or is there more to that story than you know, kind of the... well, one of the things is you've got a pretty good idea of what happened because although it was the Persians who attacked, there were a lot of Greeks in the army as well. In fact, um, one of the reasons the Persians had for invading was they were going to put what they reckoned was the true rulers of Greece back in power in Greece, sons of a tyrant called Pisistratus. So these guys actually did talk to historians like Herodotus and gave their side of the story. So um, we, we have a pretty clear idea of what happened at um, Thermopylae. And um, given what we know of the Spartans, I would say we have a reasonably good picture. So here is a case where myth and fact actually um, come together quite nicely. The but, Spartans really did comb their hair and exercise before the battle. And they did come up with the famous Molon Labe quote. And even the famous the messenger saying, our arrows will darken the sun. And they get this incredibly macho reply, we will fight in the shade. <laughs> <laughs> and they really did uh, throw the uh, Persian ambassador down a well when he demanded a tribute of earth and water. He, they did, yes. He said the Persian sign of submission, you see, was to give earth and water to the ambassador, to say you have the earth and the water of our land. And in the case of the Spartans, they did not say this is Sparta. What they did is they tossed him into the well and said, go and get it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, they're remarkably consistent in their approach to things, you know, and, 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 and that's kind of an interesting point that you bring up, which is that um, the early on kind of what makes Sparta go and, and is that they're very innovative. I mean, they come up with this society that's completely different than what anybody else comes up with. But then later on and, and really after Thermopylae, and I understand that that's an entire different book, The Fall of Sparta, which you have also written. Um, but uh, they they kind of get locked in. They're like, OK, this is where, you know, this is what's brought us uh, the uh, Aegean League championship last year. So we're going to play the 
exact same strategy for the next 300 years, it doesn't work so well. Exactly. And when we look at the fall of Sparta, that's what we see. We see a hidebound society that's so determined to believe they got it right that they don't put in any of the changes they need to save their own state. But, by the way, I have to go back to in terms of being consistent, is in the Persian Wars, the Athenians were fighting to um, help the Greeks of Ionia because there were a lot of Greek settlements on the coast of what is now Turkey. And the Spartans, as we know, put up this great fight at Thermopylae to hold the Persians back. But by the time we get to a generation later and the Peloponnesian War, the Spartans who are losing at this point to the Athenians turn around and say to the Persians, look, um, you can have Ionia in exchange. Give us enough money and ships to beat the Athenians. So <laughs> there is a degree of inconsistency there, we might say. Right. Oh, nice. Nice job. And kind of interesting to me, two things. One is, and, and we were talking about this before, but that Athens and Sparta they're not very far apart, are they? They're, they are, for these two places that are so different and are kind of the, 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 the poles almost of the uh, Greek world, they're, they're not quite within view of each other, but they have, as you, you've pointed out in, in this picture, there's a mountain that you can see here from Sparta that you can see the same mountain from Athens. They are not very far away, are they? Indeed not. And you've probably heard of a guy called Phidippides, yes? Uh, a, a runner of, of some repute, yes. Yes, he, he ran the marathon, which was 20 miles from the Battle of Marathon to Athens. What people don't mention is that um, two days before, he ran a marathon, well, he ran a mega marathon from Athens to Sparta, asking the Spartans for help. And when the Spartans said, yeah, we'll get there eventually, he ran back to Athens with the news. And from there, he went and fought in the Battle of Marathon, he then did the run from Marathon back to Athens with the good news that they'd won. And then, not entirely surprisingly, <laughs> he died. But even now, there's um, an event, which is the modern Sparta Marathon, where hundreds of people every year start from Athens and try to run to Sparta in what I think is something like a 36-hour marathon. And only a couple of dozen make it every year. Chris, something that you and I can uh, look forward yeah, to. Yeah, I'll, I'll be now. there. Yeah, I'm going to start I'm, my training now. <laughs> I'm uh, on that. <laughs> yes, Frank, Aphrodite hated the Spartans, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yeah, Frank, I was going to ask Frank's question, but I, but I wanted to stick one in here. Um, you know, my, my wife uh, is an archaeologist, and she studied uh, ancient Greece, and that's kind of one of her areas of interest. And we always kid each other, and she'll say, well, you know, honey, you're, you're interested in the 20th century and World War II, and you have like eight years that you have to worry about. And, and I, I studied the ancient world, and I have thousands of years that I have to worry about. Yep. And you, you've got warehouses full of documents that you can look at, <laughs> and I've got a few. H how does an ancient scholar go about researching the Spartans? How do we know what we know about the Spartans? Um, this is one of the problems that we have with ancient history is you guys, as you say, have kilometers of material, literally, yeah. if you look at the shelving. Um, whereas we rely on Oh, somebody here made a joke about the Spartans. How seriously do we take it? Um, here's something interesting dug up by the archaeologists. Are we to assume that this is typical of Sparta, or is this just a one-off thing that they found? So an awful lot of what you hear historians saying, well, this is the definitive fact about, is actually quite often guesswork. <laughs> <laughs> right. And um, what we know about the Spartans could be easily overturned. Have you heard of someone called the Oxyrhynchus historian? I have not. Okay. Um, Xenophon, who I mentioned earlier, wrote a book about what happened after the Peloponnesian War, up to close up to the fall of Sparta when it got um, beaten by the Thebans and Spartan supremacy ended. And for many centuries, Xenophon's history was the only one we had to go on. And then People excavated a rubbish dump at Oxyrhynchus in Egypt, which contained a lot of ancient papyri, and found that somebody had done the equivalent of wrapping their ancient fish and chips in a book <laughs> of Greek history and chucked the papyrus in the rubbish bin. And these consist of several pages of what looked like a very well-written, very well-researched Greek history that forced us to rethink entire chapters of Xenophon. 
And if one day we do unearth a complete history, then probably our view of Greek history will have to change completely. Or well, particularly things like Spartan history. Athens is pretty well documented. Huh. Wow, it's uh, yeah. it, it's it's amazing stuff. And Maddie, we so appreciate your joining us today. And we want to. I, I I am I am fearful that I might have butchered your last name when I introduced you. So say it for <laughs> me one time so that I don't butcher it this time. It's Matty Shack. Matty Shack. Okay, I did butcher it. So, uh, uh, the rise of a warrior nation by Philip Matty Shack, and he says everybody should call him Matty. So that's what we've been doing. And we will. And and we will continue doing. And he also has a second book, The Fall of a Warrior Nation. So uh, he's got the whole story there. He's working on other stuff. What, what are you working on right now? Um, right now I'm following up my book on lost and forgotten peoples with a book on lost and forgotten cities. So I'm looking at cities that were basically wiped off the map during antiquity and um, only being rediscovered now. Well, when it comes out, Maddie, give us a call and maybe we can have you back on. It's been great. Thank you so, so much for joining Thank us. Thank you so much, honey. It was really, it's been a really pleasure. interesting. <laughs> it was great. Thank well, you. Cheers. Bye bye. Um, uh, a refreshing uh, hour of history yeah, and ancient different. history. So that was, yeah, that was a lot of fun. Uh, so, Chris, you're um, uh, out there on uh, uh, on the road. You're in uh, you're near Aldborn. Uh, uh, you're headed over probably in the next day or so to uh, Normandy. Yep. And uh, you know, we promised people you were trying to choose among four different uh, yeah. campaign hats, and yeah. uh, people voted uh, on Facebook. And uh, what's the result? What are you going to be wearing well, this year? Well, I, I was going to say. In Normandy? That this is, uh, and, and I, I was on tour today, but I didn't wear a hat because I hadn't done the big reveal. Um, so, despite the sunburn that is now on the top of my bald head, uh, it was a close. It was a close election. Uh, lots of votes uh, on either side, but in the end, um, the new hat. Right. It's my my Royal Canadian Air Force hat. So I'll be wearing this with great pride this year as we tromp around the battlefield. The Bruins were close. The Bruins are close, but since, as so often happens, they broke my heart and stabbed me in the in the chest and blew the Stanley Cup, we can just move on from that, and I'm not bitter about that at all. What a shock that you picked yeah. the hat with a nice Canadian maple leaf See? right there. Mm -hmm. I, I can't even believe it. I know you it's can't believe that I would wear a cat. Hard yeah. to believe that such a, a Canadian <laughs> file uh, would... Okay, whatever. Um, <laughs> yeah, we'll have a whole show on Chris's hats over the years. I think so. I think, yeah, we, yeah. I think this could be a new episode, History Hat e Hour. <laughs> History Hat Oh, yeah. oh, oh, oh. Listen, if you watch today's show on YouTube, please subscribe. If you watch it on Facebook, please follow us. Uh, we're desperate for the attention. Uh, you can sign up for our newsletter at our website, historyhappyhour.net. We don't send it out too often, and it's really good when we do. Last step, last newsletter, you can read about bunkers in New Jersey. So there you mm -hmm. go. Uh, not everybody's writing about that. Uh, next week, Chris, we're going to zip forward from ancient Greece, and we're going to be back into uh, one of our, uh, you know, probably most common interest areas, which is World War II. And My wife is be, thrilled, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, uh, so I think there's a little bit of information, a few sources for the Battle of Midway. We're going to be talking to Brendan Sims and Stephen McGregor, and we've had Brendan Sims on before, uh, uh, and he uh, was terrific. Uh, and he's got a different co-author, apparently. He's uh, polyauthorous. And, um, <laughs> and uh, oh. so we'll uh, be talking to him about um, the Battle of Midway, and that title, The Silver Waterfall, comes from... Um, the uh, description of the Dauntless dive bombers as they dropped down onto the Japanese fleet. Someone said it was beautiful. I mentioned it was a Japanese person who said it reminded them of a silver waterfall. So that's the Battle of Midway next week. And, you know, we had a bunch of people saying in uh, the comments that we should be doing something about 1972. We have, we have, we're kind of going, we're, we've kind of heard you already because uh, on uh, June, I think it's June 19th or somewhere right around there, we are going to be interviewing the author of a new book on the Watergate scandal on the just about the 50th anniversary of that. So we are, we are thinking about 1972 and going to do a little bit of stuff on that. We're so, getting there. 
we got and we got lots of other interesting stuff coming up so thank you so much for joining us maddie thank you for joining us everybody and chris uh godspeed with you on your tour as you head down to suffolk house and across the uh channel there to normandy yeah if i get some facebook friends out there make sure you, you, you check it out i'll be posting stuff as we go along it's the first band of brothers trip in a couple of years so we're really excited to be back on the road and say hi to george luz uh and uh get some I jolly will. ranchers yeah all right. i will have some jolly ranchers thanks everyone be safe Thank <laughs> you.